My mother always said this, when you do something, you put a lot of love into what you do. And when you give, you give it freely. You don't expect anything to come back. Mama always said that, you know, and, and my dad always said, especially with the music, he would say, you, you go, go make them happy. Those, those very simple words lasted till today. Kuipo Kumukahi has been making people happy with her music since she was a teenager. But her motivation goes beyond just entertaining. She believes in preserving history through mele, songs that document places long gone that continue to live on through her singing. Kuipo Kumukahi next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Kuuhipo Kumukahi has received multiple Nahoku Hanohano Awards that recognize and honor her achievements in perpetuating Hawaiian music. Her love of Hawaiian culture started at a young age, growing up on land that her family has lived on for generations. I was born in Honolulu and went to Hilo, and I was raised in a place known as Ale Omae, which we didn't call it that, that name then. It was the general name of that place was called Kalawa, but Ale Omae was more specific to where our home is. And uh, I don't recognize either name. Where, where is that? It's about seven miles north of the city of Hilo and right along the Hamakua coast. And in fact, um, when you drive out there today, what you're driving on is the actual rail, railroad track. When you go to my house, it's the original um, roadway or highway that went around the island. So when you take that little scenic route, and you'll know that, oh my God, ha did we have to drive on this, <laughs> you know, in the old days? It's, a lot of it is scenic, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it really is. And um, so where we are, uh, really stretches out all the way down to the cliff. So we get a perfect view of Hilo, Hilo Town or Hilo Bay um, and all the, the open ocean in front of us. And that's really a, a beautiful thing. You kind of don't want to leave there. So it's a place that you can just kind of stay and you don't need to go to town. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, what was your life like? Uh, there was just the three of us because I'm the only child. And because it was just the three of us, my friends were my dogs. So we always had dogs around the place. And there was always something to do, never bored. We played in the yard, threw the ball, eat the guavas that were there, you know, running in the sugarcane field and chopping the sugarcane and sucking on that sugarcane. We'd go down to the river. A lot of times they'd come home wet because they were chasing frogs. And then I'd go, I'd go with them and sometimes friends would come in so we'd go together and we would be able to, you know, go look for opai. You know, river opai and sometimes you know that hihi vai the sort of people on well the snails call. well yeah it's like the yeah the freshwater uh, opi but they're we call it on, in hilo v and v is the hawaiian name for famine so i'm not sure that that's the stuff that they were eating back mm -hmm. then when there was really no food available but anyway the rivers were filled with uh, opai and and this V, and so we'd go down there, we'd go get and come home. Or Are there still opai in the mountain stream over there? Where we live, no, not really. Um, there was an issue of uh, prawns being put in the river for some aquaculture, I think, which kind of wiped out all the opai uh -huh. and the, the V. So when you were a kid, I mean, that was, everybody wanted to go get opai in the streams, and there were opai to catch, but yeah. not anymore. Not anymore. Not, people just don't grow up with that knowledge anymore. And you, don't, and you know, you don't see it at luau's anymore. Back in the day, you know, in the luau, you had you had the opai and you had the, you know, the ake, which is the liver, and you know, all these other things that you don't usually find today. And then we just, I miss them. But I don't know if people know how kids know how to eat that anymore. So, but that was fun. That was, you know, that was the pastime, and it was, it was better to do that than go to school. Did you get lonely? I mean, you had your dogs, you had your parents, but did Not you really. feel isolated? Not really. Uh, I, I always had a yearning to go home, even if I was at school and I had my friends at school. We did all we, we did at school, but it was always time to go home. I wanted to go home. I was never forced to go home. I just want to go home. Are you still a homebody? Yes. <laughs> really, you'd rather be home. I'd rather be You're home. an entertainer and you would... I'd rather be home. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love the entertainment. I love people. Uh, I, I, I love to see their faces. Um, but there is that time that I just kind of retreat to home. And what is it about home that 
that you love spending time in? I mean, besides, you know, it's just the chance to relax and to be around familiar things. When I go home to Hilo, it is pure grounding. There's so much mana there that the rest of the world doesn't exist. It's just home. You know, the kupuna are buried there. We have a church on our property. The family is there. Um, everything still remains the same. My parents are buried at home. Um, my grandmother, my great grandfathers, you know, everybody's there. So it's just that sense of grounding and you just can spiritually regroup. And that, that's what makes it all worthwhile for me to, and that's why I yearn to go home. Do you think that was a form of wealth? I think so, because I used to tell my mom, I said, um, we, Mama, how come we don't, you know, we're not rich like everybody else. We don't have a lot of money like everybody else. She says, no, we don't need, we have all of this. We're rich with what we have. So it gave me a sense of bigger gratitude and appreciation for what we have or what I have as opposed to what I don't have. And so what, how would you consider, when you, talk, when you think about the wealth you have and when you grew up with, what is the wealth? The wealth, the wealth is home, the land, to be amongst family, to, be, to understand the importance of caring for the land caring for family members, caring for yourself because you have to remain healthy so you can care for everybody else. Um, just to be humble in that. Um, and that, that in itself is, you know, it, it's a kuleana, it's a, it is a responsibility, but it's a good one. Mm -hmm. It's not a burden, it's just a privilege, it's an honor. Your father was a manaleo, he was a native Hawaiian speaker. Mm -hmm. Never spoke to us in Hawaiian at home, but uh, words here and there. and. I used to ask my mom, how come he wouldn't talk to us, you know, and he said, she said, well, because they were taught that English was better. Oh. We should learn English. Um, didn't he uh, not only grow up speaking Hawaiian, but it was exclusively Hawaiian for some of his childhood? Yes, up until age 11. He lived out in the country, so everything he knew was fishing or hunting, learned from the grand, the grand folks. And so by the time he came to school, this was out in South Kona, Okoi, South Kona, and his mom was living in Punalu'u, which is um, in Kau, and the school he went to was at Pahala. So by the time this kid was coming in, he was already, you know, beyond kindergarten and, you know, up until 11 years old, still speaking Hawaii, but going to school. And all the kids, my mom said, all the kids would chase him because it was such a novelty that this half-breed Hawaiian boy couldn't speak English. So from there, he, it had to, it had to change. So I don't know what kind of teasing he went through or what kind of, uh, any kind of negative uh, repercussions he was getting, but it was full on English immersion for him. So that's how he was able to you know, switch over. I'm just grateful that I was able to learn Hawaiian, speak to my dad a little bit, listen to him and understand what he was saying. Um, and I think that kind of got us even closer. You talked about your mom wanting you to help people. You know, her name is Florence. So I used to tell her, you mind, I think you're Florence Nightingale, <laughs> because she was a nurse. And she helped anybody that needed help. She was the nurse of the family. Uh, she was the helper of the family. It's just, it was just her way. And I learned that because when it was, when family needed help, I was the one tagging along. In fact, it, not even tagging along, I, I just had to go because it was just she and I. It was my dad would be working out in Kona. And so we would go together and um, whatever that took, if it was family who was sick, we'd take them to the hospital or take them to the doctor and I was there. So I understood all these things. Was that what she did? Was that a, a job job or was that just a kuleana? Was no, that's a, a kuleana? family kuleana. She and just took it upon herself. Did she also have a paid job? Oh yeah, she was a nurse too at Hilo Hospital. She really favored working with adults with mental illness. And she would bring me. And in fact, it started when she was at Leahi Hospital here in Oahu. And the nurses, other nurses would be worried that this young girl in the presence of these, you know, the adults with mental illness, wasn't my mom afraid? And my mother says, what for? They're just like us. My daughter shouldn't be any afraid of this at mm -hmm. all. And so I got, it just, was a part of me to be working with, you know, adults or be around adults with mental illness. And today I work with adults with intellectual and developmental um, disabilities. It's kind of full circle again. So yeah. that's, that's a, 
That's mama's teachings. Kuipo Kumukahi's idyllic childhood was interrupted when her family moved to Honolulu for a year. That's when she started becoming interested in Hawaiian music. 1969, uh, we were here on Oahu because my father got transferred. He worked for the Department of Transportation. He got transferred to Oahu to um, help finish the H1 freeway and start the H2. Well, he was an inspector, he was road, a road inspector? road inspector. So we moved here, and it was here that uh, when my mom went to work at Leahi Hospital, we all transferred here. I went to St. Patrick's. and Where did you live? In Kaimiki on Alohia Avenue. And it was funny because my mom's family was all, we're all living next to each other. It was our house, my mom's sister, and my mother's brother. And that's how things started up for me as far as music was Is concerned. That, so until then, you weren't no, playing I, music? You weren't exposed not, to music? I, I was. Uh, we had, um, you know, back in the day, those turntables uh, with the 33 records on it. Uh, we had, um, I think my mother used to play this uh, album the Holly Kulani Girls. And I used to just look at the picture and all these ladies with the guitar oh, and the bass. Oh, Nani Vai. No, this was uh, Alice Fredlin's, uh, Linda Dela Cruz and um, Sybil Bright. Sybil Andrews, okay. Sybil Bright. So Alice, Linda, and Sybil were, were these three women and the picture was so nice of these women with their instruments and I used to look at it and I used to think, well, what's it like to play these mm -hmm. things? You know, I've seen them, I've heard them, but I've never touched any of them. And so when I came here, and uh, I had no friends, because all my buddies were back home, and I had to make new friends, there was one ukulele in the house. And my mother's youngest sister would come to the middle house on a Friday with all her gang from the newspaper, and they would drink and play music. And you know, I was a little kid there, watching and listening, and, and everybody kind of sang, sang the same songs um, over and over. So if it was this Friday and this lady was singing, next Friday was that lady singing these same songs. And then I realized that when we weren't with the friends gang, when we would go to auntie's house somewhere else, like for Thanksgiving, they knew same songs. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, then maybe I'm supposed to know the same songs too. So after hearing it over and over, then you kind of start mimicking these songs, then you start learning the songs. So after a while, it was all these songs that became, they were very common amongst everyone. And when this ukulele, when I finally found that ukulele in the house and I picked it up, I was trying to um, be like my aunt with her ukulele. And so my mom saw that. So my mom, there was these, there were these music song books that I think most families had in town and they were kind of just cheat books and they would have the, the words and the chords and the diagram. And so my mother said, well, here, here, go, you can learn this. Oh, you, you could see how you to place your fingers? How to put your fingers oh. on the, the chord charts, you know. And so I would match it up and put my fingers on the ukulele. And I would see my auntie and I would look at that and I would go home and try to figure that out. Oh. And then finally my mother said, you know, if you're gonna play ukulele, you cannot only play, you have to sing. Don't be like your auntie. She only plays sometimes. She doesn't sing too much. <laughs> Is this much. year 10 or 11 years old at I'm this 10. point? I'm 10. So my mother said, well, here, learn how to sing this song. I said, Mama, I don't know how this song goes. So she picks, she picks a song she knows. She, she starts singing it, and she says, OK, now you match your fingers and how it, he, how it sounds to what I'm singing. So I started picking up on what things sounded like. Wow, what a story. Play. So for me, that's where that started. And um, and then later on, you know, my mother gave me this guitar. And I, I looked at it and I said, I don't know how to do this. It's had too many strings and my hands are too small. She said, well, there's the book and you can learn. When the family returned to Hilo after spending a year in Honolulu, Kuipu Kumukahi's mother made sure she kept up with her music practice. First thing she told me after we settled in back home, about maybe a month later, she says, "All right, I'm taking you to the music store, and we get you getting you an ukulele." Did she think you had talent, or did she think it was just a fun thing for a kid to do? No, I think she saw something, and it was because of her, really, that that's why I play music today. Was there a family tradition of music? 
We had some family members who did play, but not like some other families who come from a lineage of um, musicians or kumuhula. No, that wasn't in our family because our, um, my grandparents were, you know, they were ministers. So Hawaiian music or, you know, the secular music and uh, hula wasn't allowed in the church. When we had the family luau, the, the reunions, and, you know, our family would sing. We'd sing and we'd start off with church songs. You know, the church songs that everybody knows today. And um, that just became ingrained. And till today, I'm still singing those songs. And that's just how it has been for many musicians, that they've learned from family. So you went back and you were, you were already pursuing music, but not as a career at that point. You no. probably weren't thinking career. Mama said, music is not a career. <laughs> It's a hobby, she would tell me, because she saw how I was really loving to go that way and, and just getting involved. So, um, you know, I learned, I learned how to play the guitar. Then uh, Hilo backed that up a little bit. I met up with some people who could play, and this, I was 15 years old, and we all, my, I, I joined the canoe club. And, our, and our, my canoe buddies, some of them could play. So we'd sit under the coconut tree and we'd play until the coach would yell out, get in the canoe. <laughs> oh, okay, drop everything and run for the canoe. Uh, but that was from, from that kind of collaboration. Then you kind of wonder like, wow, they know this, I know this. And let's, well, let's, let's make a group. Right. So that's how you, know, you start collaborating and then other people know other songs and you learn their songs and they learn yours and you just exchange. And, and it just grew and grew and grew. Was it always so. traditional music, or did you do other types of music? Mostly traditional Hawaiian, as, as it, we knew traditional Hawaiian music, yeah. That's interesting, because you could have gone another way. You could have but, gone, you know, contemporary rock, blues. But somehow the people that I met up with, that really wasn't in their being. It was Hawaiian. Mm. Yes, they knew a few, you know, and, and even myself, I mean, we know stuff from, you know, a little bit outside of the Hawaiian music, but it always came right back to the, to the foundation that was Hawaiian music, and it was always fun to do that. And then when you really get to meet the people later on who actually made those songs popular, like for example, Auntie Genoa Kiabe making Alika very popular, it was like, almost hit the ground. I'm actually meeting this lady. You know, it's your, your idol you've come to meet and, you know, respect. So to me, that, that, that was the, um, that, that was the biggest honor for me to meet those people as well and to know their music. And, and so it, 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 just, it just flourished even more for me. And so Hilo, after a while, after growing up, uh, 17, 18 years old, he, it was very hard to find a bass player in Hilo, so my mother went and she bought me a bass and I learned the bass on my own. And now I became the bass player of the group and so, you know, I could at least do three instruments, and that was fine. And I'm okay with that today. <laughs> <laughs> Kuipo Kumokahi moved back to Honolulu in 1985 and has been playing Hawaiian music on Oahu ever since, both as a solo artist as well as with many notable musicians. Yet she remembered her mother's warning that music was not a career. But I had met uh, O'Brien Eselu. And so when I moved here, he asked me to be a musician for his halal. And that's when I started learning. Um, that, in fact, that's where I met Auntie Genoa and, I, and Karen Kelvi Hawaii. And it was from that environment I got to learn what was necessary for hula. And then I, I performed it, a bunch of marimonics with him and then started going off on my own and then met various people in my lifetime like Chris Kamaka and uh, Del Beasley, Brian Tolentino, and Greg Sardina. We all started playing music together in the Waikiki Circle. And then we were musicians for Karen Kiawe Hawaii and then that just grew and grew and grew. Then we started recording. And, and after the recording for me, then we, as, a, as a group, we kind of went our separate ways. And I, did, I started doing solo performances and um, Till now with the Hawaii Music Hall of Fame serenaders and that it's just been a beautiful journey of Hawaiian music. Your mom said music is not a career but you have you've <laughs> you've you've played you've played a great deal is it not a, a, 
a career? I mean, you, you do have a day job. Of course it is. Um, well, you know, my mom's school is that, you know, you, you got to work for the state and be a retired state employee and, you know, have the benefits and this and that. And, you know, and I think as time went on and she knew that, you know, the world has changed and it's not about just being a state retiree anymore. It's about what you pursue and what you love. And so I think that's what she was trying to gear me towards. But but she you, knew but you sound like you listen because you're, if you've got a, a regular job during the day and then you're somehow managing to, to do night gigs. Yeah, it's part of that learning. But uh, more importantly, I think it's because, you know, economically, it's very rough to be a musician in Hawaii. You couldn't yeah. have done, you couldn't have supported yourself no. with just that. Mm -mm. No, I, I know there are a few people who do, but realistically, if you want to live um, comfortably, I, I don't think it, uh, it's economically wise to just be a complete musician, Hawaiian music musician. You'd probably have to be diversified um, because there, it just doesn't sustain you. Even though you've been the female vocalist twice <laughs> and yet a traditional Hawaiian album of the year, songwriting honors. Even so, uh, I think keeping a day job, we always joke, we gotta, in order to play gigs at night, we gotta have a day job. In addition to the satisfaction that Kuipo Kumukahi finds in sharing her artistic expressions through her music, she's also carrying out a personal mission to preserve and perpetuate traditional Hawaiian songs. I'm real ferocious about Hawaiian music and how that needs to stay and why is it important to be involved in making that stay here. And you've seen a time when um, traditional Hawaiian music has just dwindled, especially in Waikiki. Huh? Exactly. Hawaiian music is, and I say this to the audience all the time, is, Hawaiian music is just not entertainment. Hawaiian, what we, what we sing, we're the vehicles that convey this message, this documentation of a time long past, all these songs that are sung document something, some event, someone, some place of this time that's passed. Like, for example, songs like Maki Ailana, that doesn't exist anymore in Waikiki. Where is Maki Ailana? Nobody knows. But the songs, the song documents this place. What does the song say? Well, it talks about this island that, exist, uh, that existed before the Alawai Canal was dredged. And so, it's down by where the Kapiolani Park um, Honolulu Zoo is. And the, and the backstory is that, you know, it was a place where people would frequent, young couples would frequent. But, you know, once the aloe was dredged, all the water was pulled out of Waikiki. And so now you had all this, this dry land. And then the resort came up, the, the island is gone. So that's the kind of important documentation that still exists in these songs. What do you think is going to happen to Hawaiian music, traditional Hawaiian music? I think uh, if we don't pay attention, I think we could lose it. Uh, maybe seeing, I hope not. I hope this prediction is wrong. But I think even with resurgence in language, even resurgence in language, because you know, unless you know the media helps us out, television, radio, um, to really put forth traditional Hawaiian music as well as contemporary, because we need the younger people understanding how to write and, and putting the, the music notations and, and you know making that palatable to the ear, because that's what Hawaiian music really is. It's very healing. And if without the help of media, I think we're, we're gonna lose it. I mean, I think people are, we are so displaced already. We are so scattered. Hawaiian music is, is something that binds us, that's, part of the malama, you know, uh, you have land, you got to take care of it through the generations so that it can stay with the family, not just because now you're tired of it. But this stuff is really important for Hawaii, for Hawaii to, I cannot tell you enough, like Nalani Eha, look at their music. Uh, their music, as we discovered when we were doing the album Nalani Eha in 2007, what other sovereign really wrote songs for their people? And, and there were four of them writing it. Exactly. And they were very good songs too. And we're still singing them today, as long as you know them. You know? And if you don't, then somebody would listen and they'd catch up and understand it. But these, these little pieces of information are huge impacts on, on who we are as a society and a culture and a tradition. Hawaiian music, you know, in the Lanier House time, it was Hawaiian leadership to know how to write music. That's not present today. 
you performed at Iwalani Palace singing songs from Nalani Eha. What was that like? It was, I can still remember it so clearly. To first being asked, that was a very wow factor for me. I was in the throne room and it was, it was so magical. Everything was alive for me that night and it was, just, you know. That was a beautiful I, performance. Oh, just so beautiful. And so Ku'uipo Kumukahi continues to do her part to keep Hawaiian music alive through her artistry and commitment to perpetuating traditional mele. Mahalo to Ku'uipo Kumukahi for sharing her deep passion for her culture. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. Oh, hey. Oh, my oh, 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 oh